you'll never get anywhere. It's, I always like to, and, and, and I'm, I'm not perfect and I fail at it all the time, but if we can go into conversations thinking about how we can have the next conversation, how I can be kind to you and listen to you and disagree with you at the same time, but try and come to, you know, some understanding, help me understand more or I'll help you understand more and then have the next conversation where we can Wait, come I, to. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely impossible for any of us to uh, claim that we have all the information necessary yeah. to make all the proper decisions on every single subject out there. Yeah. And you might consider yourself an expert on a particular topic um, and you're not probably, <laughs> you're well, really even probably not. It, real academics. Uh, people who are intellectually honest anyways, they will change their minds when new evidence comes out. That's, that's the whole of what science is supposed to do, right? They're supposed to, we have this, we believe so, this based on this evidence. And then when new evidence comes out, oh, well, you know, we, we adjust and we see how it all fits together from there. So it's not really any different with politics. We just, you know, we want the best for people and we have different aims of doing that, but we can figure out things that are better and, and we shouldn't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, like tax right. cuts. You know, yes, I am for no taxes. I'm a voluntarist. I don't believe you should be forced to pay taxes, but am I going to rail against tax cuts? No, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I, I, I mean, and I believe that that's a perfect utopian world and that we should absolutely push for that. And uh, it's going to take some time to get there. There's, there's no a lot such thing as a perfect utopian world. Well, I mean, there's, true. there isn't, but, uh, you know, I think that there are better solutions, you know, like I think that a lot of times people say they, because of the system that we have, and it's based on taxation that, um, you know, they're afraid if you remove that, well, what happens? How, how do you take care of people? And I get that. That's a, that's an honest concern, right? Cause right, right. now some people are being helped and they're called corporations right. by the government. <laughs> Generally speaking. Uh, so how do, how do we continue to help people? And there are solutions out there. There are a lot of things um, that people have come up with that fit better and help better. Uh, charitable organizations, they have to be more responsible with the money that you give them because they don't have unlimited pockets like the right. government because the government, when it needs more money, what does it do? It just goes, you have to pay more this year. Yeah. I don't care what your situation we, we is need, at home and what our, you're going through. We need our built-in automatic 10% budget increase yeah. every year. Exactly, or more. <laughs> you know? So uh, this, is, this is what we're saying is that uh, we want to help people. We might have a different... Um, ideal and a different uh, way of going about it and a different foundation than say the the two party system but maybe you should listen because what we've got isn't working well we, what and i would argue that what we argue is way more in line with things that the founders would i uh, would uh, argue than anything Absolutely. we're talking about right now well they the founders were radicals they were, they were. you know they were outside like they they, they well, were, they thought they thought that we shouldn't have just one king being able to set all these exactly. rules and do as they, he pleases. That the people themselves should be governed right. by themselves. So and, they tried to come up with a system for it. Right, and 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 you know my ideal system, the voluntarist type system. I, I always explain it like the um, governance as the consolidated school districts. So I know many of us are older and remember when your parents could go down to a school that was in your neighborhood and they could talk to the principal if something was going on and, and get it changed, come up with a solution together, uh, maybe have a meeting, figure it out as a school for right. what's best for that school. Right. Well, then they started consolidating school districts. And ever since then, you've seen power get centralized to these school more, boards more, more. further and further away from the people that the, the school is supposed to be serving. So that's, that's, it's the same with government. It, it, once we keep centralizing and centralizing, it gets further and further away, then communities lose. You know, why should Alabama have to live like California? They should both get to live how they want, but right. they shouldn't be able to force each other to do different right. things. Right, absolutely. So it, cult it's the same way with your neighbors. Yeah, exactly. And, and we have, in this country, we have probably 11 or more different cultural nations, basically. So why should we be able to, here in Tennessee, force someone in Iowa to do things the way that work best for us? 
But that's what, what people do with the federal system. They well, go to the federal government and say, they need to be doing the, this. Well, that's the problem. And people don't want, uh, people are too freaking lazy to have a conversation with somebody they disagree with and come to some sort of a compromising mm -hmm. position. Instead, what they want to do is elect an official to force the other group to do it. And that's what we have. It's and and that's it, it is. And it is violence. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and swlpodcast.org. Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I am delighted to have Sherry Voluntary. Um, she has she's a voluntarist and she has a, a YouTube channel, Sherry Voluntary, um, and she's on Facebook under Sherry Voluntary. And then you can also find her work under a Facebook page called Little L Little. The word Little spelled out Little L. And then L, the letter L, Productions. And you can find her work there. She's also on Twitter under Sherry Voluntary. She's coming in from Tennessee. We're going to talk about her path to volunteerism, homeschooling, unschooling, um, government schooling, peaceful parenting, and fun stuff like that. So, Sherry, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I first heard... Of you, you. I think Larkin Rose posted his recent interview with you, and uh, yes. I listened to that, and I'm like, wow, this was really cool. And uh, you know, I like your style, and I listened to the Eric July interview. That was really cool too. I, <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, of Eric's as well. I listen. I, I um I um I interviewed him twice. I think yeah, once, and then the second time when he released his uh, statism music video. Oh, cool! Um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I love metal, so I really I enjoy it. My <laughs> my kids call it ear poison, but <laughs> I love funny. it. Well, <laughs> actually, I'm the opposite. I'm definitely not a, a heavy metal guy at all. Um, I mean, I like rap. I mean, my brother is kind yeah. of a rapper a little bit. Um, oh, cool! And so he kind of got me into that. But um, yeah, I'm not really into metal too much but i uh i certainly could appreciate the lyrics and and the music so i definitely make exceptions so yeah <laughs> i mean i'm just happy that people are putting out different messages on whatever medium they choose you know either it's yeah. you know poems or books or documentaries or you know heavy metal it doesn't matter to me um it's just uh it's just you know or podcasts or youtube channels it's just the way right. that we transmit you know ideas through various mediums on the internet and it just makes the world a more mm -hmm. beautiful place yeah, I, I, I agree. I was just um, actually in my uh, chiropractor's office the other day getting adjusted and that song by the police, um, Spirits in the Material World, came on. And I was like, this is anarchist as all get out. Like, this is a really <laughs> anarchist song. I mean, if you go back and listen to the words, it's it's really awesome. It's like there's no political solution. And ah. there's, there, you just have to go back and listen. It's, it's a great – I always liked that song, but it didn't really – 
you know, I'd sing along when I was younger, but then now I heard it. I was like, Oh crap. That's you hear things new again. When you, when you become an anarchist, everything's a little bit new. (laughs) Yes. Yes. That's so true. So, so in that spirit, if you could uh, get into your, your path to volunteerism, how you came to this philosophy and what um, books, podcasts, or or figures influenced you along the way? Uh, well, um, I really, I mean, I started out as a pretty neocon Republican. Um, I was one of those people that, I was always a little odd because I, I was really involved in ROTC in school and I almost went into the Marine Corps after high school. Um, thankfully I didn't, but, uh, I always had sort of that side. And then I was also involved in the arts and I was kind of into a lot of alternative things. So I, I don't know. I, um, I definitely had that side to me, but I was never really, I was always kind of, trying to do what was expected of me, I guess. And then, so I was a big neocon and I was really, really in support of the military and, you know, the police, things like that. And uh, I felt like the Republican Party left me. Right? I didn't feel like I left the Republican Party. I just felt like, well, I'm for small government and George W. Bush is not for small government. Like, what's going on here? So, um that's when I really, I I moved to Tennessee from Colorado. I'd been living there and uh, moved back here. And I started listening to um, a radio show out of Atlanta called Neil Bortz, the Neil Bortz show. And um, he, he branded himself as a libertarian. I would say he was probably more big L libertarian for sure. Um, But he started talking about eminent domain and I had never heard about that before. So I was really just shocked that the government could just decide it wanted to take your property, right? Because you own your property, right? I thought at the time that you could own property. And um, so I started calling myself a libertarian, even though I didn't really know what a libertarian was for a while before um, I got, it took, it took a while. So uh, then I think my husband started, we were both kind of talk radio junkies. Like I listened to Rush every day and, um, you know, I, I hate to say that now. I, 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 it's almost so weird because I, I couldn't listen to it today, if, even if I wanted to. Hmm. But uh, I he started listening to a show out of Minnesota, I think it was, called The Jason Stapleton Show. And um, Tom Woods would sometimes sit in for Jason when he had to be out. And Mike heard him on there and said, hey, I like this guy looked up his podcast, and then it was the old six months to anarchy. Like, it really didn't take long. Um, we read a lot of Ayn Rand, too, before that, and so we were kind of already getting primed. We were we were reading some of the things that generally lead people to anarchism, uh, but uh, it, it, it didn't take long at all once we started listening to Tom and reading Rothbard and things like that, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's great. I um, yeah, I never listened to Rush Limbaugh. I, I can't I can't admit to that. <laughs> to me, to, to me, what growing up, I was really um, indifferent towards politics. I didn't care about it. I was interested in other things, you know, like chess and piano and acupuncture and alternative yeah. medicine and that kind of stuff. Philosophy, astronomy, cosmology. That's what interested me. I didn't care about politics at all. Um, but uh, but yeah, the two thousand eight um, elections. Um, I, oh yeah, I didn't really vote either because I didn't care. And my mother's like, you know, I didn't care who to vote. My, and I just asked my mother because she really wanted me to vote. So I, I said, who should I vote for? She's like, Obama. It's like, all right, mm-hmm. I'll go vote for Obama. But then after that, I started learning more about what government is and laws and taxes and all that. And uh, never voted again. And um, yeah. and to, to my mother's shock and dismay because I come from a very strong Democrat slash uh, socialist type background. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, books. Yeah. 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 Ayn Rand. I actually never read any Ayn Rand books. Um, yeah, I know some, quite a few yeah, libertarians, anarchists are influenced by Ayn Rand. Yeah. I never actually read any of her, but I, I have read some excerpts and, uh, you know, there's a uh, one, uh, I think it's from, um, what was that? What's the, her main book? Um, Atlas Shrug. Right. Atlas Shrug. Right. I think the Atlas Shrug where, where there's like a big long speech about money. 
Is that yes. is that Atlas Shrugged? I yeah. think it's I think it's Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. Okay. Cool. There's, she loved. She was. She was part of. <laughs> she had a brilliant mind. I don't particularly love her style of writing. Um, I read Anthem, which is a much smaller book um, with a lot of the same principles, and I and I love that that story. But I never read the the bigger ones or any of her philosophy, um, like capitalism, things like that. My husband did, but I just I didn't. Yeah, so, I didn't care to get that technical. Yeah, so I started getting into precious metals and central banking, learn, learning about that. And uh, and this guy, Mike Maloney from goldsilver.com, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, he made uh, he Hidden Secrets of Money documentary episodes all about um, economics, free markets, precious metals, central banking. And it's excellent, very informative. And then he made one video like just saying um, – <laughs> You know, reciting that whole speech from that Atlas Shrugged book about money. Very beautiful, nice. very, very poetic. And I, yeah. you, know, you know, really came to understand and appreciate the function of money in a civilized society, you know, and, and how yeah. that is completely necessary, not only to catapult humanity towards greater levels of prosperity, but also as a way to, um, as a way to, you know, constrain people who are seeking political power, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and constrain them from like, you know, profligate spending, you know, war, deficit spending and, and, uh, you know, all that stuff. And so, you know, that's why the, uh, the Federal Reserve and other central banks had to have been created in order to, you know, shrug off and break those chains that were restricting them. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you really begin to understand the, the really vital element of money that will, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the function that it plays in society. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I think, you know, money gets such a bad rap. Yeah. Um, for one, because you have this sort of Judeo Christian view of, um, where, you know, money, the, the love of money is the root of all the, all evil. And most people, they conflate that to money being evil, but that's right. not what it says. Right. It's that love of money. So if anything that you, you know, our greed is not a good thing. So, right. well, necessarily, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think that people don't understand that it's, it's, if you have a chicken and you want to trade it for some wood, it's much easier to evaluate the value of things. If you have a standard that, that can be used for and that, and it keeps things peaceful. I think that's what people don't understand is that money really is a vehicle for peace because, if I know I'm getting, I'm not getting gypped because I, okay, I see the value, the, the market determines this value for my chicken and that value for the wood. Okay. I'm going to need two chickens. I'm going to give, you know, and you don't have to carry all that stuff around. You don't have to figure it out. You've got this representation of that. Now, mm. you know, of course with fiat currency, we don't have that. There's a lot of problems with it, but the basics of it are very sound and very, um, they lead to that peaceful, nonviolent, uh, ends that that we want so yeah i think it gets a really bad rap <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah definitely i mean economics and especially monetary history is something that i love to teach people you know about precious metals and fiat currency and central banking because so many people have no idea at all about that you know it's like that's one yeah. of those that's one of those aspects of uh of the economy that people usually do not have any opinion whatsoever it's like everything else like you talk about you talk about you know war people have an opinion about that you talk about taxation people have an opinion about that you talk mm -hmm. about immigration people have an opinion about that <laughs> you yeah. know you talk about economics fiat currency precious metals nobody cares <laughs> it glazed over in front like, of your face what like, what what are you talking yeah. about who cares about that <laughs> let's yeah. talk about and more it, important things <laughs> Economics is something too that people really don't understand what it is. They think it's math, yeah. and of course there's some math involved, I guess, but mostly it's life. It's just it's the way life works. And I think the more I learned about economics, the more beautiful it was to me. And it really is mm. is more about how people's incentives, why people do what they do, um, what incentivizes people. It's it's a really really interesting study in human nature, I think. So I. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a deep diver into economics or anything. You won't. You know. I'm not going to read um, Human Action or anything like that. I mean, I <laughs> I love Mises's 
what his impact has been on the world, but yeah. I've not read, I'm, I probably never will read human action. I just, I maybe, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't have any plan to right now. There's so many other things that I want to read and right. that are just, um, not as, as deep of a dive, I guess. <laughs> so, so, so talking about like educating people in economics, um, a wonderful tool for that, especially when you're talking about kids and homeschooling is the Tuttle twins. Yes. Uh, do you, you own any of those? Because those... I mean, every single one of them oh, that he my has. God. Me too. I, I just got the recent ones. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure we got them um, recently. But yeah, my, my daughter's even in one of them. You know, he had the GoFundMe where he, you could donate so oh, much money. And draw... Yeah, she's in. Um, wow. Oh, gosh. The, the Golden Rule one, I think, is the one it was. Ah. So yeah, she loves, she told me she gets up and reads um, the, the Atlas Shrugged one. At one point, she's not doing it anymore, but she said, Mama, I get up and I read my Atlas Shrugged book every morning because I just love it. Mm -hmm. And she loves the Golden Rule one. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've got the monster that ate Jekyll Island. Yeah. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah, she, that one, that one's, she hasn't really gotten into that yet. She's read them all, but oh, wow. they're, great. they're fantastic tools. I think grownups should read them, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think um, there's another book I got by another author who's a voluntarist, and I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, we read it several months ago, and I've forgotten, but there are people out there producing great content, you know, for, for kids and teaching them these things that most adults just don't get. And so our kids are really on fire. Like mm -hmm. my daughter at her um, we homeschool. And she does a co-op two, two and a half days a week now mm. so that I can have a little time to work. Mm. Um, and she, they said to pledge at her co-op and she wouldn't say it. And so, um, I, she said them, the kids, this is second grade, right? They're pressuring her to say the pledge mm. and she wouldn't say it. And, and they said, Evie, you should say it if you know it. Like, <laughs> you know, they were just really putting, so I, I talked to her teacher and her teacher said, well, that's not right. Like her teacher was really sweet about it. And, and we sat and we had a great conversation about it. And uh, she said, you know, when you think about it, it's kind of Nazi-ish. But those were her <laughs> words. It's kind of Nazi-ish, the pledge. Uh -huh. But I thought, well, that's a great, like she's already recognized that this this thing they're doing is indoctrination. Mm. So, um, you know, she was really sweet about it and, and said she would handle it if there was a problem. But I you know, the kids can make a stand because I told I told my daughter, I said, look, if you if you want to, you you can do it. I'm not going to like this is your decision. You get to decide. And so if you want to do it and you don't want to deal with the hassle, the pressure, that's fine. That's your decision. Um, I said, but if you want to take a stand, that's fine, too. And it's OK, because that's what you really believe, and what you really want to do. And we should do what what our convictions tell us to do, like what we feel like is right. Mm. And so she said, Mama, I'm not going to do that. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really great. I really felt proud of her. for sure. doing it. Sure. I can see I can, I can see how you would feel proud. It's like you're not you're not telling her to sit down, but she's doing it of her own volition. Right. That she's refusing to. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, so so what I was gonna say is, um, there's another book. I don't know if you you were you were thinking about this one, uh, by a volunteerist, Anam Pashenta. Is that it? Three friends free. Oh. No. No, that's not it either. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, that's Anam Pashenta. He's uh he's on Facebook, uh, another volunteerist, and he wrote this book, Three Friends Free, and yeah, wonderful oh, cool. book. I got that too. You should get that. Awesome book. A little book about you know about how how government you know, grows and grows and, and initially want, you know, basically initially is for people think it's for protection, security, then it just grows to in, immense proportions. So, and, 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 you know, wonderful illustrations. So, so yeah, cool. my kids, I, I love that. I, I think that's entertainment is such a great way. Like I love what Eric is, Eric July is doing um, because entertainment really, it, it's, it's a, it gets to people we could never get to otherwise. And books and, you know, mm. any literature, music, yeah. um, especially the more kind of like there are a lot of great artists uh, that are libertarian. But, um, you know, to get to the, the music industry standard and what what that sounds like and, mm. you know, kind of more mainstream is difficult. I get that. And so um, there's not a lot of people who are at that level. And mm. so it's, it's really, really great to see someone where people who don't know anything about libertarianism are going to. Uh, 
you know, a concert and, and knowing all the words to, to like statism or something yeah, <laughs> or practicality right. or something like that. So right, 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 right. it's, it's, um, I think that's amazing. I think, I think we need to encourage more artists and support them, you know, just yeah. to put that stuff out there. Yeah. And there's also another book that I got for my kids, uh, when, when my daughter was one and my son was three, it was called a is for anarchy. Have you heard of that one? No, I haven't. <laughs> and wonderful book, and uh, and great. so it's it's basically the whole alphabet, you know, all different kinds of fun words for the alphabet. So the first one was A is for, a is for anarchy, and basically this kid throughout the book just having fun, doing whatever he wanted, you know, just having fun, and uh, and then at the end of the book it's like, and then if if you if you want to. Just because you can rip up this book, just because it makes you happy, and guess what? The book eventually got ripped up. <laughs> wow, that's but that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah, and and yeah. And, and get this. Uh, so my my one year old daughter, she could you know she just started speaking, but she heard this word anarchy keep saying over and over again. So she started to say Ankiki. I want to be Ankiki. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> That's sweet. I, you know, yeah, I mean, buddy. people people indoctrinate their kids into some wild stuff. Why can't we like <laughs> teach our kids that like to actually live peacefully and and right. produce things in the world that help humanity and yeah. you know think? I think the best thing you can give your kid is a dangerous mind, uh, and yeah. Um, oh, yeah. you know that's that's gonna be with them forever. So I think those things tar- help to start them on that road of being an actual thinker. Yeah. So I want to hear about, you know, your homeschooling uh, life and how you do it. Uh, but I'll just say one thing, which is, um, you know, one of the reasons why I love homeschooling and unschooling is is uh, it puts kids more in charge of what they do. And uh, and it and it, 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 it's, it it sends the message to them that it's important to, for us to know, for the parents to know, what are you interested in? What do you want yeah. to do? And uh, and will help you pursue that, and it kind of empowers them. Whereas when a child goes to government school, they're not empowered at all. It's like I don't care what you want to do. This is what you have to do. This is what you have to know for the test. Who cares what you want? (laughs) You know, it's completely disempowering. So I feel like with my kids, um, you know, they have a, a, a strong sense of self and 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 confidence. And so when we go out into the world. And we're interacting with other people. My daughter is unafraid of other people, especially adults. She just goes up to anybody. Hi, yeah. what's your name? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like she says hi to people, like completely unafraid, you know, not timid at all. And I think that's probably one reason, you know, is because mm-hmm. I we, we really try to, um, you know, respect their decision and th- their thoughts and what they want to do. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kids, kids have a great inner compass as to... Sometimes, you know, who's not so great and who is, I mean, mm, they, of right. course they're young and they make mistakes, but, mm. but generally I think they're pretty, pretty smart about people. <laughs> sure. Um, and I, you know, I, um, so I homeschool, I have a, an almost 16 year old and an almost, or she's just turned eight, sorry, um, daughter. So, uh, you know, there's quite a spread between them and they're quite different. So mm. we actually do two different kinds of homeschooling with them. Um, and I don't know if you, did you want me to tell how I started? Please. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Why you so, started and what you do. That was really child directed. Um, it was something we sort of admired for a long time, but we thought, well, that's a lot of work, you know, we're not going to do it. We were worried, um, that, you know, I, I, even for the first couple of years we homeschooled, I kept thinking, I hope I'm not screwing my kid up. You know, mm. I hope this is okay. Mm. And, um, you know, not anymore. I really, really get it now. And I'm glad we did it. But between fourth and fifth grade. So um, our son Ronan went to school from kindergarten to fourth grade in public school. And then uh, he came home. It was well, it was between this fourth and fifth year of the summer. Uh, I was getting time to get back, get ready for school. And he said, Mama, can we just not go back to school? Like, I really want to homeschool. Um, So he's he was, he was shy kid, um, very, you know, kind of a sensitive child. And, um, he had like, he's, he, he didn't get bullied or anything like that, but, um, uh, well, by one of the teachers he did, but not the kids. Uh, but it just was like, we had no family time. That fourth grade year was really terrible. And then some of the things they started teaching them, like 
he came home. We had to write a note to his teacher about the Articles of Confederation. There was something, I can't remember the details, but it was basically saying that people don't actually have a right to have a gun. Mm. I can't remember how it all went, but we were like, this is, this is not right. So mm. um, we decided, well, you know, we could give it a try because he really wanted to do it. Um, and we thought it would be great for our family. Uh, my husband is Canadian, so we, we try to make it up there to see his family as much as possible. And we could travel and it would just, you know, we saw some be- some real benefits to it. And uh, so we did it. And at first we kind of pieced together a curriculum. And our son wasn't having that. He just, he was like, he came to me like two months later. And he's like, I need to know where I'm at and what my goals are and how far along I am. And mm. like, he just, he really, that's the kind of person he is. So we um, went with the Ron Paul curriculum ah. and um, I love it. I'm, I'm very much like, I love the self-directed learning uh, that he gets. And so he, you know, they have classes and things, but he also does a lot of his own projects on the side. He brews kombucha and mead and <laughs> shoot, that's cool. He, he did a mead for me. If you're listening in SA, like he's not a bootlegger or something. <laughs> <laughs> don't stray from our house but uh yeah and and he loves he wanted to be a mycologist which Ooh. is the study of fungus right. and mold right right and so um but then he said well i think i probably have to work to, for the government and i don't want to do that so what? <laughs> yeah and he's into aquariums he's like built several aquariums he built one for his sister so Ooh. there's all these things that he has time to do that are cool. his interests cool. um and then you know the ron paul curriculum teaches them to really um, they encourage people to get in and out of college, like clap out of everything you can if you're going to go to college or be entrepreneurial and start your own business. So I, I was, I really, um, for him, it's been a great fit for our daughter. It was a, a different story. She is a much more independent minded person. She does not like to be told what to do by anyone and uh, even when she was little, like she wouldn't let us teach her to swim because she kept saying, I know how to swim <laughs> because she just, she was not going to be told what to do. Like all That's these funny. things, she's, she's something. Uh, so uh, with her, uh, my producer, Dan, his kids are um, unschooled and I wasn't really sure about that. So, you know, I kept thinking, I, I just, I'm having a hard time with this. I don't know if they'll actually learn anything or she will. And, um, so I thought, well, we'll try it because I had tried to teach her to read and she was just so, um, she just gave me so much pushback about that, that we really couldn't get anywhere. And it was, we were miserable. We were making each other miserable. I'm like, why won't she just listen to me? (laughs) So I, I decided to try unschooling and I was amazed at how well she did. Um, she taught herself to read Hmm. because, she loves Minecraft Ooh. and she wanted to be able to interact with the other kids on Minecraft. Mm-hmm. So then she taught herself to type and she's, um, we got our little typing program so she could learn how to do it, you know? And, uh, she also taught herself. She spelling was important because some of the other kids would make fun of how she would spell things. So she learned to spell and now she's a really good speller. So I, I was, I was really, really impressed by that. Um, so that was the first year. And, uh, now, um, I did, she's in a co-op, uh, this year, which is uh, two and a half days a week. And I, I, I really just needed some time where I was, didn't have her here and, and her needs and she could go to this co-op and have her friends and things. Um, and so we decided to do that, but, uh, I chose this one in particular because it's very cooperative. They, they, co-parent with you and you're still in charge of what your kids are doing and they just kind of help guide you. I mean, they have a curriculum that they've put together, but you know, you, you're still, they, they really see themselves as just like a supplement to your parenting, you know, uh, what you want done. So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, co-op it's given us both some time, uh, where I can work and just, kind of focus, but I don't know if we'll do it again next year. She, she really liked unschooling a lot and she was really, she learned so much. I'm always amazed at how much the kids learn when they do what they want to do. <laughs> so, so, um, okay. So, so your daughter loves, un, uh, what's it called uh, Minecraft. You said, um, yeah. and, and she taught herself. To read. Yeah. My, my son, 
he's also a big uh, Minecraft guy, and uh, and we also use. Oh, by the way, I'm a chess teacher. I don't know if I mentioned that oh, to you. Awesome. <laughs> I play. He was I, on the chess team in, in when he was in public school. <laughs> your son? Yeah. Does he still yeah. play? He he does. Lo- he loves to play chess, but does he play online? Um. I, I don't think he has in a long time. Maybe he could play you. <laughs> yes, I play a lot online. Actually, I teach um, I teach chess. So so I teach, I have students that I teach online in person. And I also teach group classes uh, in schools, like private schools. Um, I'm actually going to teach at a Waldorf school starting uh, January next year. So that's pretty cool. I'm excited about yeah. that. Um, but my, so both of my kids know, because I'm always playing chess all the time. We go to the park, I whip out my chess, I get my chess books. So I'm always playing chess, attracting people. And so I didn't really sit down and force them to learn chess, but they just picked it up because they see me playing. You know, that's it. <laughs> and And so my son, eight years old, he definitely understands the game much better than my daughter. And much deeper, and uh, I mean, she still love. They love to play each other all the time, and actually, you know, they see me doing chess puzzles all the time on my phone. And so I just saw them like just yesterday. My son was was composing chess puzzles for my daughter to solve. That's cool. <laughs> I, thought that was, I, thought... I, I love it when you see their relationship as individuals together, separate yeah. of you. Because because yeah. my son, like he he's teaching my daughter to play the guitar. He just uh, learned, and he uh. said. Hey, you should learn to play the guitar. So he's been teaching her, and and it's it's really great to see that because as as a parent, I don't know, I feel like one day we're not going to be here, and right. they're going to have each other, you right. know, and that's it's important for me. So I I love seeing them develop a relationship that is totally separate from us. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I just I love that. I I love the that they have the time to do that as well. Um, it's my the guitar is something my son wanted to do. Uh, and so he's been teaching himself and he's gotten quite good. And, and now he's able to share that with his sister. So, you know, those are things that you can't, you might not necessarily get the time to do. in when you're in public school, so mm-hmm. I, I'm just really, I'm really thankful for the whole, um, homeschool movement mm-hmm. that, uh, has, has kind of started. Cause I, in this area too, there's a lot of, um, of course, really uber conservative, uh, homeschoolers, but there's a lot of um, secular ones too. So it's gotten much more broad. It's not, people often think when you homeschool, they think, you know, you're like, you should wear a bun and no makeup or something. I don't know, but <laughs> at least in this part of the country, there's a certain look, you know, a certain kind of person that people think homeschools, but there are a lot more um, secular homeschoolers as well who aren't doing it for religious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I love about what we do, I mean, I just say we do a hybrid homeschooling, unschooling. I mean, because we don't follow a specific curriculum. We yeah. like dabble in like, you know, chess. There's a chess website called chesskid.com. Definitely recommend for your son. Mm-hmm. He would love it. Um, although maybe it's a little bit, um, you know, uh, like childish maybe for him. Like there's other more adult websites he might love. Sure. And then, and then, um, and then there's MathBot. You remember the guy, did, uh, J.W. J. Weatherman? I interviewed the guy. And, uh, yeah, MathBot's great. Yeah, and we're doing that MathBot. My son loves that because my son he understands like not like like your son. You said logical like that. That's my son. Logical with math and chess. He he, he yeah. understands it. You know, and that, that's how his mind works. Whereas my daughter, she's much more you know physical and you know athletic with her body. Yeah. And so she. Mine too. That's funny. Our kids are similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's funny. And yeah. my daughter's big into gymnastics and ballet. Dancing, and yeah. singing and you know that kind of stuff yep. dancing she loves yep. it my mine too we she we do hoop dancing and um she just performed in front of i think it was a crowd of 250 people she did a hoop dance. we only had about six hours of practice so it, it wasn't her best performance but she just got out there and and she was like before the show she's like i'm a little bit nervous mm-hmm. but i'm just gonna go up there and do my best i'm like Awesome. That's cool. It's like, that's all you can do. Right. And she's yeah. like, yep. So, you know, I mean, they, they have the opportunities to have these great experiences and, yeah. and I know kids in public school do that as well, but, uh, I don't know. I think, I think kids who are homeschooled really get to sort of, if the, you know, if the parents are doing it and are the way we do it, it's, it, they get to kind of direct their own path and, mm. and really develop the things that they love that, which might be completely have nothing to do with us. I mean, Minecraft, like, I don't, I'm not a 
big gamer. I like, you know, old like Nintendo games and stuff. But <laughs> Nintendo? My brother, my What's son, that? Smash Bros. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, my, my son actually built a um, uh, Raspberry Pi and he made it into one of the, I forget what you call it, but it has all the like retro emulator and emulator. So I have like several like maybe a hundred or 150 games from the old nintendo (laughs) and sega and things like that that i enjoy that stuff i never get to play it anymore i don't have any time but wait wait is that on the computer yeah Yeah, he we he made it the emulator and then somehow i had it hooked up to the tv and i could play that's all i know (laughs) (laughs) wait 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 wait. so how do you play with with controllers or through the with the laptop or what with controllers yeah wow all right. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, so, you know, just those kinds of things that they can explore. And I think, you know, <laughs> you can't underestimate the family connection that uh, oh, yeah. Like our, oh, yeah. our family has gotten like I know my kids so much better right, right. than I think I did before right. um, because I just I'm with them more for one. But I'm also I'm a different person than when I was when I had my son, I was very authoritarian and, you know, I had a big life change in between them. And so I, I parent very differently. Mm. And um, I, you know, I, I think some of the best lessons that you learn are the ones that your kids teach you <laughs> because they're they can be the most frustrating people in the world because they are often just like you. <laughs> 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 Only less reasonable, you think. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it can it can t- teach you a lot about yourself, but also just seeing them kind of grow into their own person and the unique skills that they have. Um, I've learned so much from my son because he's very different from me. He's an introvert and I'm an extrovert. And, mm. you know, I just, I, my daughter is a lot like me and I really enjoy her company, but I've learned so much from my son because he just sees the world in a different way than I do. And um, that's been really, really wonderful. So I think those those real family time and ties that you get to each other make you make everyone better. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, one of the things that that really um, is important about homeschooling, I think, is just like you said, the time that you're able to spend with your kids. Right. Because, um, you know, most people, when they think about government school, you know, they think about kids go there to be educated and to learn things, important things about life and all that stuff. Whereas, whereas the <laughs> yeah. way I look at it is just like, I'm giving my kid to a stranger for, for, you know, a large part of the day. And then yeah. when they come home, I can't even spend quality time with them because they have to do homework. Yeah. Right. And so that's, it's time robbed away from your kids, you know, you being able to be with them. Um, and, and that's terrible. That, that really breaks up family bonds. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah it, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I think that, uh, public schools are probably, um, one of the things that people think are the, the least, um, detrimental thing to society. But I, I believe they've probably been one of the most detrimental things to ever happen to society is the, the idea that someone loves your kids more than you do or as much as you do and will, will want to really educate them. I mean, you know, especially when you get into what the, the philosophies that we're involved, um, are learning and, and that, you know, you see how it's really a, um, it's a device of the state to teach how to be good, obedient citizens. Mm. It's not really to educate people. And, um, you know, that, that used to be so more where, you know, when you had the one room schoolhouse and kids, they went and learned the three R's and then came home and, you know, worked on the farm and Mm. it wasn't an all day thing. And that was generally a town getting together and hiring a teacher to come in and teach their kids these things. So that, you know, that's not the state. Um, where now, I mean, you, we in Tennessee a few years ago, um, one of the they had like a questionnaire for the kids, and it was asking the kids, do, "Do your parents smoke? Do they smoke inside the house? Does anyone in your house ever yell? Mm. You know, how many drinks a day does mommy have? Like mm. these weird, very intrusive things." Mm. And uh, luckily, there was a stink made about it. But a lot of people think that's just a okay, and that you know that we need to protect children from their parents and. And I know that there are times when kids are abused. That's true. But on the whole, I think most people want to take care of their children. I even think most people who abuse their kids don't want to be child abusers. So, um, 
there are a lot of interventions that can happen that don't include the state whatsoever. Uh, and we don't, you know, we don't need that kind of intrusion, intrusion into our lives and oversight because if who loves your kids more than you do? Nobody, mm. nobody loves my kids more than I do. So I'm going to try and do what's best for them. So, so let me ask you, um, what was the reaction with your family members and your husband's family members when you guys decided to homeschool? Um, they were all like actually really good with it. Um, my parents are conservative Christians and, you know, they thought that was great, uh, cause they, they see, you know, we don't necessarily teach what they thought it was, I guess, or whatever, but, um, <laughs> They they were they were really for it like they cool. that didn't get any problems. I know people who have mm. or especially a lot of um, single parents who are co-parenting with someone that is really against homeschool, and that makes it very difficult. Sure. Um, but yeah, we we didn't get any pushback. There were some questions uh, from people, but not really any like everybody thought that was really cool. They think homeschool is good. Like generally around this area, homeschool has um, a good reputation. Knoxville is very homeschool friendly where we live. Hmm. Um, and so there are tons of homeschool groups and activities and classes. We took um, science classes at the zoo for years and at one of the children's museums. And my daughter takes one um, at the nature. Uh, we have a nature center and uh, there's just, there's tons of stuff for, for homeschoolers to do. And there's all kind of discounts on things for homeschoolers. So um, it's a very homeschool friendly place. But I have the only people who have ever really questioned my parenting decisions have been strangers in like line at Walmart or something. Like, why aren't you <laughs> in school? Are you sick today? Did you have a doctor's appointment? Right. Like, no, we're homeschooled. And they're like, oh. And then they'll turn to me like, how do they get socialized? I'm <laughs> I told, I actually ended up walking away from one lady in Walmart one day because she was getting rude. But I said, you know, humans have been around for, according to some people, thousands of years and according to others, millions of years. And, you know, how, public school has been around, what, 200 years, maybe? I don't even know. Like, I think we can figure it out. Like, I don't think we need it. We seem to have made it this far. Okay. Oh, like, but she was very like, she was probably a school teacher is what I'm thinking. <laughs> You know what would have been a great response? Sometimes when people are, are you know, very serious, but, but still their question is slightly idiotic, I uh, I kind of turn into a joke because that's just, that's just the way I am. So, you know, I would have said, you know, you're right. If the state is not making sure that my kids don't have any friends, they're not going to have any friends. I guess you're right. right. You know, there's no way for them to make friends. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think, too, one of the things that people don't um, account for that, I think used to be much more common is the intergenerational friendships. Mm. Uh, my, the reason we moved back to Tennessee is because my kids being close to their grandparents was really important to me to one set of grandparents. And my um, husband's uh, mother is much, much older than, than my parents. She's older than my grandparents. Um, and so, you know, we, they were younger and we live here in the United States. So it was just easier. We moved back here. And that has been just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see my parents blossom into grandparents and, and how much they just love my kids. <laughs> um, but also because we homeschool, like my, my husband or my son knows a, a lot of, we live in a, a neighborhood where it's mostly older people mm. and he knows so many of them. He'll walk out and take, he loves to walk in the neighborhood. So he'll, he'll talk to them and, you know, take out their trash, they whatever. But he has these little friendships going and, um, I just, you know, I, I see these other friendships developing with my my daughter and other people that are not necessarily her age. My son, or my, I'm saying son, my uh, producer's youngest daughter is 12. And like, they're, they're kind of like, she's taken my daughter under her wing as like a little sister. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing. They, she just spent the night over at their house last night and she mm. just, the, their daughter takes such good care of her and really just they love each other. And so um, they have the time to do that when they want. Like she didn't have she didn't have to have school. like you have school in the morning. You can't go. And she does do the co-op. But it's um there's just so many relationships that really build community. Like if you really want better communities, you need more relationships and communities. And the state doesn't do anything 
towards helping build community. It breaks down community and the public school system has been a huge, huge factor in that. So um, I, I really just love seeing the, those relationships and my kids learn thing from, things from other people and that, you know, it's, it's a community of parenting, like, you know, a village. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice thing when you see that. Yeah, there's a comedian. I forgot his name, um, but there's not many comedians that talk about homeschooling, right? But this guy did, I think, because he was homeschooled. And and one thing that he said was funny was, uh, you know, the socialization thing. You know, everyone says, how are you going to socialize your kids? Right. And then he's like, what's the most common reason that kids get in trouble in school? Socializing. socializing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Yes. It's the funniest thing. And, it's like Yeah, I was always I always got like my my um class participation was always great, but my my report cards would always say, you know, Sherry talks a lot <laughs> and she socializes a lot and I, I would always hear, you know, uh, school isn't for that. School's not for socializing, school's for learning. That's funny. But yet, yeah. So uh, they don't even know what they're talking about. It's funny. It's <laughs> and the other, th and the other thing is, I find that um, you know, people who advocate for government school and they and they're like quizzing and interrogating homeschooling <laughs> parents. Um, it's almost as if they're they're like you know, asking these questions to evaluate the intelligence of the homeschooling parent. Like, right. did you do your research? Are you smart enough to home? You know, all these kind of questions. Don't have whereas, a <laughs> whereas, yeah. where, whereas, most likely. The parent that has researched the idea of, of, you know, how do I educate my child the best is probably the homeschooling parent. You know, the, the, the parents who, who send their kids to government school, they, what do they care? The state's going to do everything. It's like, okay, maybe we'll move to a different district, but, you know, w you live where you live and you send your kid there. You really got no, no, no uh, recourse. You know, yeah, they totally give up their their you know parenting responsibility to make sure their kids get an education, right. and that was one of the things you know people used to do is hire a, a tutor for mm. their kids when they when they were a little older. Like they didn't do that when they were younger. They waited till they were a little older, then they would learn French and yeah. you know the Bible and handwriting, all those things. Um, so that was pretty common. And then you have you know more the socialization of you know, home, the public school, the state wanting people. And, and I think it's um, Dewey, the guy in the early 30s, I think it was, who was the big in the public school movement. Um, he basically, it was because, I think this comes from um, John Taylor Gatto's work, where he talks about how they actually wanted to start the public school system, like really in full force, because they were worried about, the Irish Catholics and Italian Catholics, um, t you know, having influence over uh, people and, you know, they wanted to keep it more Protestant and um, they wanted to be able to Protestantize those kids and kind of, it's an interesting take on it. But, but I think that you always see the state trying to socially engineer what it wants for its benefit, not, not for kids benefit. Clearly mm. I, I was reading a study once um, where they had taken kids and um, in a school and they told some, they were smart. They said, mm. you're really smart. And right, they told right. the other half, you're, you're hard workers. And then they gave them a test that they knew they couldn't do. Mm. And the kids who were hard workers did way better than the kids who were told they were smart. Mm. Um, mm. And then also, uh, this is the one I was thinking of, where uh, there, there was a principal in the New York City school system, I believe it was, and this was a long time ago when principals had some uh, power in their school. He decided not to teach math until fifth grade. Mm. He just wasn't going to do it. Because it just it's frustrating to little kids to learn things that are too abstract. They can learn to count, but right. they're not going to really understand multiplication, division right. that great. Right, right, so right. Um, he started teaching them at fifth grade. And in like within a few months, they were caught up to people who had been doing math this whole time. And they mm -hmm. had a better self view of how that they were able to do math. They felt better about it because you hear so many people say, I hate math, which I'm one of those. But I had terrible experiences as a kid because mm -hmm. I wasn't getting it. And I feel like, you know, I always felt, well, I'm just dumb and I can't get math. I just don't get it. But right, these kids right. didn't have that 
but that that hasn't spread like wildfire or anything across the country. So I think they very often do the exact opposite of what's actually good for kids. Yeah, and that's the other thing is um, is that government school frequently extinguishes the love of learning, you know, and that is so tragic because, you know, I tell a lot of people, a lot of parents that I talk to who are considering homeschooling, you know, they have the, the idea that, you know, you got to know everything. Like, like you said, you got to be an expert in everything, you know. I'm like, do I have to be a NASCAR driver to teach my kid how to drive? <laughs> do I do I need do I need to be you know I don't know what's the name of a world famous chef I don't know the naked chef do I need to be him yeah. wh- whatever his name is I don't know right. his name is <laughs> to to teach my kid how to cook like come on yeah. you can, we can't teach our kids the basics of life if we're um, not experts in every single field you know <laughs> it's so exactly ridiculous. what I need to do is know my child and know what <laughs> they need the most like and that's that's the the saddest thing is the cookie cutter approach it's forced collectivism mm. the school is and mm. and kids get lost they don't know I mean I had I experienced depression in high school because I just, it, I was ready to move on with my life. I didn't want to be there. Um, I could take care of myself. And I thought, well, I don't need this. I, mm-hmm. And it, it was really tough. It was a tough time. And I think, you know, you don't explore and learn who you are because you've been sort of hedged in to this one way of doing things. And, and it really can go, I was a very creative person and school just, it, it, it was depressing. That's all I can say. I never really <laughs> loved school. Um, so I, uh, I don't know. I, I just think that if people would take the leap, like I remember I always explain pe- homeschooling to people is it's like jumping off a cliff mm. because when you're coming from going to public school and that's all you know to homeschooling, it's like that because you're worried that you're going to mess your kids up and you're, you could be afraid and, and, um, because they, we've been taught that we've been taught that you really need the public school system in order to get the education that's going to make your kids succeed in life. Mm. And I think a lot more people are starting to see that that's not the case, especially with college. A lot of people are, are really understanding that you don't have to go to college to be successful. Right. Um, but uh, it, it's I, I just wish more parents, especially libertarian parents. I know a lot of them say, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't like that's one of the things I get a lot from parents is. Oh, I admire that you homeschool, but I couldn't do it. Yeah, I get and, that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm like, you couldn't be with your kids? I'm like, yeah, that's a the, – the upside to homeschooling is that you're with your kids all day, and the downside to homeschooling is that you're with your kids all day. But guess what? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's just life. They're not going to – they're going to be kids, and they're going to do things that annoy you. That's just families. Like, we annoy them as well. So <laughs> once you get used to it, <clears throat> like – how how unusual is that that we are so um, trained into this one way of thinking that the the way that families have been for thousands and thousands of years where your kids are with you all the time is suddenly something that I just can't do like I, I, you know I, I I get that mentality but I really wish especially more libertarian parents who don't think they could would explore the opportunity because I think I think it'd be just it, it it changes your life in, in your life in ways that you can't even articulate. It's just a really good. It's really so good for your family. I, I don't know what to say other than that. It's just it's the one of the best things that I think we ever did. So yeah, I really love doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I tell you know many people that I homeschool. I, I you know I'm I'm glad to talk about it with people, and they you know people ask me a lot of questions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful teaching experience for them because like, like you said, we all grow up in government school, you know, we, we ev- almost pretty much everybody grew up in government school. So, yeah. so it's so, so difficult to step out of that mindset. And, um, so it sounds like your experience in, uh, in government school is very depressing. Well, my experience, I wouldn't say it's depressing. I was apathetic. It's like, <clears throat> just like I was towards politics i didn't care i didn't care about i didn't care about ex- excelling succeeding i didn't want to i don't want to be successful in the eyes of my government school um teacher you know right. I, that that didn't that didn't um concern me what concerned me or what i was um occupied my time with were things that i wanted to learn so basically what i would do is like i would i would be happy with mediocre grades like 80s that's, that was me. I was happy with the 80s. I was just getting right. by. I wasn't failing. 
And, and so I use the extra time that I have to study things that I actually was interested in, like chess, like piano, like philosophy, Eastern philosophy, right. Western philosophy, alternative medicine, um, like cosmology, astronomy, all this fun stuff that I loved. And, uh, and that's what I, and so I taught myself right. a lot, a lot of things during yeah. school. So yeah, that, that's what yeah. I, that, that, that's my most cherished memories, <laughs> stuff I learned right. outside of school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that, I really was like that too. I, I'm an autodidact as well. Like I, I taught myself most things. I remember <laughs> one year I was in high school and I missed so many days of school that I was going to fail, hmm. but I told the assistant principal when he came to me that I, it was against my religion to go to the doctor so I didn't have doctor's notes. So he's just like, oh, and he signed this paper and, and I got to pass. So, um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I didn't care about going to school. And I, school was a really bad experience for me from very early on. Mm. I had a lot going on at home and, and I just didn't want to be there. And so, um, yeah, I something you said sparked a, a memory for me. And I, I was trying to remember what I was going to tell you. Now I've forgotten. So. <laughs> No, just saying the things I was interested in during school, you know, astronomy, cosmology. Oh, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I've read a lot. Like, I've always read a lot. Um, I, I read Dune when I was, like, 11 or something. Like, I, I really... Do, what is it? I, Dune? Dune by what Frank Herbert. Oh, um, never heard. You know, there's a movie made of it, too, uh, you know, with Arrakis and the Spice. He was actually a libertarian mm. as well. And he's. It, it's a great book series. Mm. But... Uh, I read a lot of mythology. I was really into that. Um, learning about plants and you know, there were a lot of art things that I like to do. Um, I, there was just so much else that I was interested in and it didn't have anything to do with, you know, math or doing English for four years, a language that I speak just fine. And I write very well. So it, it you know, I, there's so much you don't need that it's just a waste of a kid's time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the first time I ever heard someone talk about not being in the public school system was um, a pre-algebra teacher that I had who uh, he was an old Navy SEAL <laughs> and he said I don't think you should have to be here if you can pass the test if you can tell us that you can pass this test you know you come in and you take it and you make you know a good enough grade you shouldn't have to come and sit here school should only be for people who need need it and that was really, you know, it still wasn't where I'm at now, but it was an introduction to, wow, people could like have all their day free, like do what they want. Like kids could mm -hmm. do that, could, <laughs> you know, fill up their time with something else, something mm -hmm. more worthwhile. Right. So yeah, most of everything that I've ever learned has been self-taught and, um, you know, people often don't like my, my husband's colleagues will have a, a discussion and, They'll ask me where I went to school, I meaning college, and I, I didn't go to college. I mean, I went to photography school, but mm. I didn't go to college. And mm. they're always surprised by that because mm. they are, most people are in the, the line of thinking that, you know, if you are educated, you've gone to college. If you can, you know, ha carry on a conversation <laughs> that's interesting about interesting topics, you must have gone to college. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I love the look on faces sometimes when it's a really great conversation about something and they're like, well, where did you go to school? I didn't. I read. You know, I, I, I watch things. I, I just learned. That's, I learned. I've always been, good learn I've always been very curious. So right, right. I think that's something, thankfully, that wasn't <clears throat> excuse me killed in me in the public school system uh, was my curiosity. And um, I think most people are very curious, but the public schools really kind of kill that out of them. And that's it, a, it's a really sad thing. It really molds them into people that they're not. And I think that's why a lot of people walk around unhappy and still trying to find themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get that. I get it's not easy, but it's, um, I think it has a lot more to do with, with the public schools than we want to maybe admit sometimes. <laughs> yeah. That is the most, one of the most, yeah, I, that's what I tell people. The most important thing, the way I see homeschooling and unschooling is that, you're you're encouraging them to do what they're passionate about and and also just to have a love of learning because if they have a love of learning they're self-motivated self-directed yeah. nobody needs to be behind them saying you know work on this practice that you know right. study more nobody needs to tell them that because they're gonna they're gonna learn what they need to learn in their life you know yeah. and and that's it and and that's i would say that's how i am you know i learn 
things that I'm passionate about that I'm interested in. Like like I teach I make money teaching chess. I didn't go to school for chess. I make money teaching chess right. because I taught myself chess when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and now I'm a chess teacher. Isn't that amazing? I, th I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Like, like I'm going to go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I just, I, what you're saying, I think you're absolutely correct. I think there, there's a quote about, it's a, by a poet. I can't remember which one now, but um, said that uh, education is the, um, the filling of, or it's not the filling of a bucket. It's the lighting of a fire. <laughs> and so that's really what you want to do for your kids. It's, right. And I think the public school does exactly what you said. It teaches them, okay, this is the minimum I have to do to get by. Right. It really teaches people to just do the minimums in life. A lot of people. Yeah. Um, and then you have the kids that kind of over excel in the public school and the public school says, well, you, you can't do that. You know, <laughs> you, you really shouldn't move ahead any faster than the other kids or so it, it's not a good fit for anyone. And right, right. you can ask any, anybody doing anything, any profession today, and they've probably learned something or learned most of what they need to know to do their job outside of college. Or mm. I mean, my husband's always learning new things for his job and mm. he, he just goes and finds what he needs to know. And so I, I mean, I wasn't born knowing how to podcast, you know, and you, you just learn <laughs> things you want to, to know in order to do the things you want to do. And so I, I really, everything about how people actually live combats the arguments against homeschooling. Yeah. There's just not a way that people live that, that, and are successful that homeschool doesn't, mm. it doesn't actually do. And, you know, I, I read something too recently where a lot of colleges are actually courting homeschoolers now because the kids generally, um, they're saying the kids come in and they're, they're ready to go. Mm. Like they, they're mm -hmm. ready to work. They're not like they're, they're there to get an, you know, an education according to the school. Um, so that they're actually courting them because this they're just such they're easier and they don't have as many problems mm, right. <laughs> because I think a lot of them have just they're mature because they've yeah. they've learned to kind of govern themselves. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, good note to end on. Um, <laughs> you know, wonderful talking about this. I love talking to other homeschooling parents and unschooling parents because so many people that I talk to say. All right, so you're homeschooling. Is there anyone else that's doing that? Are you the only? <laughs> are you the only one? And you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm the only one. You know, I tried to find someone on Facebook, but no one else. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm the pioneer. You know, in this. <laughs> yeah. It's a wow. So so yeah. So I've interviewed so many people. So I can just I just send people my interviews. I'm like, look at all a bunch of these people yeah. that are doing it, and you can actually hear the way they're doing it and the effect it's having on their children. And it's a wonderful thing. You know, it's like these are testimonials. You're a testimonial to me. So that's why I love I love talking about this. So thank you very much, uh, yeah. Sherry, for sharing um, your, the, you know, your, you know, the, the life of your homeschooling family. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so before we go, I always ask um, all of my guests, um, give me uh, like a quote, your favorite quote of all time. What does <laughs> It Favorite doesn't quote yeah. of all time. Yeah, it doesn't have to be related to volunteers, you know, not necessarily. Uh, but whatever. What do you think? There are so many good ones related to volunteerism. I'm I'm really kind of not not thinking of it at the moment, but there's one I, I really like, and um, it was it's by Winston Churchill actually, which uh -huh. always surprises me. And now I'm trying to think of one. <laughs> Uh, I had a head injury once, so I, uh. sometimes it's hard for me to, <laughs> like, all Bl things will be in there, and it's hard to get them out. Blame um, the head injury. All right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that's probably not what it is. I just, <laughs> I like, I've been reading a lot of H.L. Mencken quotes. Ooh, I, think I, I really need to read good. his work. He's, he's so brilliant. Yeah, um, gosh, I can't think of it. I'm really sorry. I <laughs> Yeah, he's got a he's got a bunch of good ones. H. Joe Mencken, um, and I don't even know if he considered himself an anarchist. Probably, because he did. Oh that. yes, he was an anarchist. Oh, he did consider. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know one. This is my very favorite, actually. Ooh. I made a sign for it. So nice. I keep it in my office. It's fear is the mind killer. Ooh. <laughs> and that right. is from Dune. And there's a whole like little oh. paragraph that goes along with it. But uh, all right, all I, right. that is actually one of my very favorite quotes of all time. All right. Um, because. I think when you live in fear, you really do kill your ability to make the best decisions. Mm. And that's that's why the state wants to keep us afraid of the other side. They're going to do this to us and, you know, play that left-right 
right. uh, those positions against you because they can control you yeah. when you're afraid of everything. So I, I really love that. Oh, yeah. Statism is founded in fear. You're right. You know, fear of the rich, fear of the poor, fear of, fear of you know, illegals, fear yeah. of blacks, fear of, uh, you know, um, other countries, fear of other religions, fear. You're right. <laughs> It's fear, fear of, of homeschooling. <laughs> fear of homeschooling, you know. Um, exactly. You know, it reminds me of a great um, meme or cartoon, which is, um, you know, you see, you see one side of the river. It's like building and a ship and a church, and then the other side is the same, the same exact buildings, church, building. Uh, you, you see, you remember this cartoon? And then, and then it's like the building is like, you know, our noble government, and then the church, the church is like our blessed church, and then. And then the the the, uh, the uh, you know it's like the you know the villages you know are wonderful people. And then the other side is like those savage people that yeah. th- that decrepit building that <laughs> those criminals yeah. over there. <laughs> it's like yeah. the same exact thing. So yeah, we um you know I, I always like to tell people that we have more in common with the average Iraqi citizen than we do with our own political masters. Hmm. You know that's very true. So, you know, people, their fear is misguided, you know, of what they should be afraid or, or yeah, what they should concern themselves with, basically, you know. Yeah. So. And I always, I, I, along those same lines, I always tell people, um, if you, if someone bombed your children or, or shot them with a drone, wouldn't you hate them too? Yeah. Like, don't you, like, right, they don't, right. they don't think blowback's real. Like, if, right. bring it home to them. Like, if, if something happened to your children, wouldn't you want to, to kill these people? Like, I, know. Yeah. I would, I know. you know, I don't blame them for hating the United States government, but sure, they don't sure. understand that we're not really part of that. <laughs> we yeah. don't have any say over that. So. Exactly. Exactly. We, we didn't pull the trigger, right? Yeah. Well, wonderful conversation, Sherry. Thank you very much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, so this is uh, yeah. So this is peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, on theconsciousresistance dot com, and solpodcast dot org. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bitcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.